good afternoon for uh, everyone and uh, also who was not here in Europe. Um, good evening and good morning. Um, uh, now in this our afternoon, we will have two panels. Uh, the first one uh, on the two uh, tools developed under the project. And uh, after a section on the capital flow management, macro prudential regulation, source, and innovative financial instrument, instruments that two, three work streams uh, that ECLAC uh, coordinate and uh, led. Uh, then we present now the financial conditions indicators and the global financial safety net uh, tracker. These two work uh, tools, uh, and was, uh, they were also two work streams of the project, are especially useful for developing countries. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in this uh, project, we focus on mix and leaks, but for all emerging uh, uh, developing countries. And why? Because these countries are particularly vulnerable to external shocks and volatile global financial conditions. Then the financial conditions indicator uh, enable the assessment of how uh, the global economy environment and global financial conditions changes, named these conditions as is happening now, impact the financial conditions of developing countries. Under this project, the UNCTAD financial conditions indicators that now was renamed as new generation. Why? Because the sample of countries increased. So now we have 53 developing countries. Uh, and now the analysis uh, is based on clusters of developing countries. And their FCI provide a useful tool for diagnostic and policy design for uh, more UN member states. At the same time, the Global Financial Safety Net design with, in collaboration with the Boston University and the, the Institute of Latin American Studies of the Freie University of Berlin uh, is an innovative tool with a comprehensive information of the Global Financial Safety Net. That is the network of global, regional, and bilateral emergency external liquidity sources and these liquidity sources that are important to prevent or backstops liquid, uh, external liquidity crisis, balance of payment distress that is triggered in generally by exactly these global financial conditions and external shocks as they call it. Uh, then I, I have the pleasure uh, to present uh, the consultants, two consultants that work uh, in the development of this new generation financial conditions educator, uh, Guillaume Blanc and Patrick, sorry Patrick, it is it's because your uh, surname is, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, Kazmarski, Kazmarski, you could correct me. Uh, and also, uh, Rashid uh, Bouhia, we are ve very, very grateful for Rashid, for uh, his, co his Rashid coordinate the, uh, these uh, work streams of, uh, work stream of this project and is economic uh, affairs officer at UNCTAD. Then uh, they will present for, for you more details on this next generation financial conditions indicators. Uh, then the floor is yours. You have uh, 30 minutes. I could let you know uh, when uh, 25 minutes, then you know that. Thank you very much. You are Great. muted, Rashid. We could see. Sorry about that. Let me wish. Okay. Okay, it's great. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session on uh, financial conditions indicators, also known as FCIs. 
So the main purpose of our, uh, of our presentation today is not so to discuss current financial indicators in developing countries as such, but to really seize this opportunity to showcase, showcase the tool, showcase how it can be used by economists or policymakers. And also we will deliver examples of conclusions and lessons that can be drawn from it. So our presentation will be divided into three main sections. I will start by setting the stage, sharing the rationale behind the FCIs and the main challenges with a special emphasis on low and middle income countries. And then Guillaume will provide an overview of the statistical methodology and the underpinning econometric models. And he will proceed with a live demonstration of the tool. As you will see, the tool is very flexible and there are many ways of calculating the final indicators. And in section three, Patrick will share the economic and policy findings based on one specification among many others. So the FCIs were developed by a whole team, including Guillaume, Patrick, and I, but also Justine Faciola, who could not make it today, and Julian Baudelet, who contributed to the preliminary phases. So I used to call the team the dream team because altogether we cover a large range of skills and expertise ranging from statistics to political economy, including macroeconomics and, and econometrics. And the work really benefited from uh, reviews uh, by Professor Catherine Doz from Paris School of Economics, Professor Federico Carlini from Louis University in Roma, and Professor Philippe Baqueta in HEC Lausanne. So before I forget, I would like to inform you there are two papers available online that you can find on the website, one detailed technical report and a policy brief with concrete economic analysis and policy recommendations. So as evidenced by the name, New Generation FCIs, so this work draws on previous UNCTAD FCIs. And those FCIs, they reply to precise specifications from UNCTADs, which were issued in the project documents that some of you uh, are familiar with. So those requested specification, they first refer to, I quote, regionally based indicators with regions being defined geopolitically and or economically. And for each region thus defined, the tool should synthesize into one indicator, a wide range of financial variables. And the specification further add that taken to a meaningful regional level, the FCI analysis will provide a useful diagnostic tool for countries whose data inadequacies preclude country specific analysis. So there are here two requests. First, to reduce the information of several financial indicators into one single factor. And second, to be able to cluster countries into regions in a meaningful and flexible manner. So let me share with you some contextual information for, for you to really understand what is intended here. So the idea behind the reduction into one single indicator is to be able to make evidence-based decisions on a large sample of financial indicators as a whole, rather than in silos. So there are many financial variables that could be used as proxies for financial conditions. For example, exchange rates, interest rates, government bond yields, capital flows. But um, it is simple to make a decision when all those variables, they vary together into one direction, but this is not necessarily the case. In general, there is no clear cut. Clear, there's no cl clear cut. They, they may send different signals. So the value added of the statistical reduction technique that we use is really to examine co-movements between all those variables and to see uh, meaningful correlations to highlight uh, the worsening or the amelioration of financial conditions. An additional advantage of these techniques is that they do not impose preconceived economic assumptions and they let the data speak for themselves. I mean, theoretical economic frameworks are useful, of course, but as we all know, there, is, there isn't one size fits all. Um, an external shock can have a different final outcome depending on the country, depending on the channel of transmission, or depending on the effect that will prevail in the end. For example, uh, an exchange rate depreciation might have a negative impact on the capital accounts via outflows in portfolio investments, 
but might also have at the same time positive impact on the current account via the amelioration of the terms of trade. How tools really fit into this momentum of new economic and statistical tools building on big data and aiming to use as much as available information possible and combine it with cutting edge data mining or machine learning tools to highlight dynamics in financial conditions and holo and now casting. So this seems great, but there is one major issue. Uh, several developed countries and some high income countries have already created their own FCI at the country level because they do have the expertise and the data is available. But things get uh, much more complicated uh, for lead for low income developing countries and middle income developing countries, also known as leaks and mix, uh, where data is largely missing, sparse or of low quality. Um, this relates to the great data or digital divine, which uh, compounds difficulties for leaks and mix in elaborating their own statistical tools for evidence-based policies and for voicing their own uh, idiosyncratic issues at the international level. And this vacuum has adverse effects at the international level because most global discussions on access to concessional and climate finance, ODA, debt relief, as well as the emission and the reshoring of SDRs, uh, they greatly affect leaks and mix. Throughout the process, we collected data for 81 countries in total, and we targeted uh, a layout of 33 financial variables uh, in line with the literature. Um, those variables are expressed monthly or quarterly, and they are reported at the national level only. So here I put a figure for you to take note of the the magnitude of the missing data issue. So this is a distribution of the number of missing series in our original sample. And on average, countries have uh, about 15 missing series, which equals to an early 45% of missing series per country on average. And this clearly highlights that missing data are a severe problem for all countries. So that building reliable FCIs at the country level is not a feasible option. And the problem is even more blatant when we disaggregate the data by income. As you can see here, the percentage of missing series is even higher in mix and leaks compared with Higgs. And in addition to that, uh, there is also the issue of the quality of, uh, sorry about that, the, 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 the quality of the data, which is, uh, which is, which is lower in leaks and mix compared with Higgs. So the first policy conclusion recommendation coming to mind in the light of those preliminary data issues is that there is a need <clears throat> for leaks and mix. There is a need in, for strengthening actually the statistical capacity of leaks and mix in creating their own financial indicators uh, uh, from the public sector, especially from NSOs and from from central banks. So the, the clustering rationale is to group countries together based on the similarities of the historical data. So the gap will be filled by the information from another country in the same cluster. And there is indeed a very strong interdependence of financial conditions across countries. And there is a very long tradition in UNCTAD in highlighting the prominent role of global monetary conditions such as the, the value of hard currencies, interest rates or bond yields in advanced economies or commodity prices. And those ideas are now slowly penetrating more mainstream economics. And for our research, we use two recent papers which are becoming seminal in the fields and which really focus on the role of global factors in driving financial conditions at the national level. So our approach is in line with the literature and we use factor models. So those models were initially developed for the study of business cycles, but we are slowly moving to the field of finance with some adjustments, uh, not only in terms of economic trick 
assumptions as well as in terms of ways of interpreting the final indicators as such to make room for more Minskian boom and burst fluctuations. Our approach is very flexible. As uh, I started with, there are six ways in total of calculating the regional FCIs that Guillaume will present in more details. And I just wanted to stress out that uh, they do allow for regime changes, uh, such as sudden opening of capital markets, like the one that we observed in 2015 under Argentina. And uh, the, there is a huge flexibility in the clustering. So the user can opt either for an exempt approach, that is to use a given classification, like a geographical or income classification, or whatever grouping he may come up with. Or he can opt for an exposed uh, uh, grouping, which refers to the automatic grouping of countries based on similarities of financial conditions across countries. So I'm gonna leave the floor now to, to, to Guillaume for the continuation of the presentation. Thank you, Rashid, and uh, thank you for the opportunities to, to participate in this discussion. Let me share my screen. I think you should be able to see it. So as my, my colleague Rashid said, we provide a general framework and an accompanying tool for computing the country level and the regional, or what we call also the group level FCIs, so the financial condition indicators. And we do that following a two stages approach. So in the first stage, uh, for each country, we extract the country level, uh, the country level FCIs. And uh, in the second stage, the countries are grouped and for each group, we extract, we extract the group FCI as the regional indicator. So I'm going to uh, now give you a, a high level overview of our statistical model and uh, later on the showcase, uh, showcase our tool in a quick uh, demonstration. So in the first stage, we need to compute the country level FCIs. So the, the financial condition indicators for each country. So the FCI for a given country is based on the country's financial data, uh, as well as some global, global monetary indices, as Rashid said. For instance, we have the lending rate. We look at the total credit, credit amount, the debt service ratio. We can look at the commodity price index, the volatility, volatility index, the emerging market bond index, and others. Then for each of the country, uh, we look for what these financial variables have in common. That is what can explain their common variation over time. And this, what, what, what they have in common is what we, call, which, what we call a factor. So it is obtained using a method called factor analysis. And this factor is uh, the country financial condition indicator. So for our purpose today, you can think of, uh, of this factor as a fancy weighted average of all the financial variables which favors the variables that are more common to one another. Uh, for instance, if a variable is nothing like, uh, if a financial variable is nothing like the others, it will not affect the factor. <clears throat> and importantly, the extent to which a variable affects the factor is called a loading and is represented uh, in this graph here by the width of the arrows connecting the financial variable to the factor. And if the, if the width is greater, it means that the the loading is bigger, and thus the contribution of this financial variable to this factor, to, to, the, to the indicator, is greater. Uh, so we also implemented time, or time varying approaches where the loadings themselves, so this, the width of these arrows, are allowed to change over time to better capture the systemic changes uh, that may occur over time. Uh, more information for that is provided in, a, in the paper. We don't have time to, to get into the details here, but we have many, many different ways, well, three different ways to actually compute uh, the FCI. Uh, of course, if we want a meaningful factors, we need also meaningful variables. And for this project, these variables have all been carefully selected uh, by Rashid and the team uh, in order to obtain the most meaningful uh, financial condition indicators. Now, once we have all these country level FCIs, so one FCI for each country, we do a second stage factor analysis. So here again, for instance, we have here the FCI of country one, and we group the FCIs uh, of, of various countries together, and we use these 
to create a factor, but this time a factor of the group, the group level FCI. Likewise, this factor will, uh, will <clears throat> uh, have different contributions for the various countries that it uh, comprises of. And the, the, the larger the arrow here, which means the larger the loading uh, of the country, uh, it means that this, uh, this country will, uh, will in the end contribute more to the, to the weighted average that, uh, that is this, uh, this uh, group, uh, group level FCI. So, uh, so in a sense, if a, if a country belongs to a group, but has a very low loading, it means that uh, it didn't affect the, the group level FCI. So that in, in turn, it means that the group level FCI that we, that we, that we create uh, may not be uh, the best indicator for this particular country. Nonetheless, it will be an, an overall uh, general indicator of the group. So of course, different grouping will provide different group level FCIs, of course, and a different overall fit. And this choice uh, is very much dictated by the goals of the analysis. Uh, so different analysts may have different, with different goals and therefore different groupings. And as Rashid said, we have two different grouping options in our tool. We have the ex ante grouping, which is a, a group level, uh, which is where the group level FCIs are extracted given a grouping that is provided by the analyst. For instance, when we group the, the country, countries according to the UN income based classification, for instance, low income, middle income, and high income countries. And uh, <clears throat> this is what we call a priori or ex ante grouping. Another method is the ex post clustering. And uh, uh, here in this method, uh, we group uh, the countries together so that the overall fit uh, is the best possible. So the overall, uh, these loading values that, uh, that I explained before, which represent how well a country fits into its, its uh, group are the highest possible among all the combinations of countries, among all the combinations of groups, uh, this will provide the highest one. And so this creates opportunities for new economic insight, as my colleague Patrick uh, will tell you about in a minute. Uh, uh, the, the takeaway here is that ex ante grouping cannot result in a better statistical fit than ex post clustering. Now we'll quickly uh, show, you, uh, show you the tool and demonstrate how that works. Uh, so the tool has been implemented in the R software for statistics and computing. Uh, as Again, as, as we explained before, the tool is not so much a predictive tool, but it's, it is rather an exploratory one. It can be used to better understand the financial conditions of a given country and to give an objective measures of the similarity of these conditions to other countries in our panel. Uh, okay, and so uh, let me go and uh, show you, for instance, uh, how to use the tool. So first, you need to, if you want to, to create an ex ante grouping, you need to provide uh, the, the tool with the grouping that you want to do. And for that, you need to simply fill in, fill in this uh, um, Excel sheet. And here, for instance, we provide the grouping for high income, middle income, and low income countries. <clears throat> and for each country, we decide whether uh, the country belongs to, to, uh, to, to each of these groups. So for instance, if we have Afghanistan here as the first country, it becomes it, it is a classified uh, as a low income country and so it will have a one here to let our program know that it belongs to the low income country and you do that for all the countries in the panel. All right, once you have done that uh, you are ready to launch uh, our code first we have we have to launch so so this is this is the R program this uh, the R studio uh, environment and first uh, first things first we need to load the data and the data has been pre-processed uh, by another program that I will not demonstrate but that is part of the tool as well and uh, so we simply need to load the data here and then to uh, uh, compute the country level factors this is this line once we have all the country level factors, we, uh, uh, we load the group that we just uh, uh, created. And then we fit the group uh, using uh, the a priori or ex ante method. Okay, and you run, the, you run the code. And in a matter of seconds, you obtain uh, the result, which is, uh, which is a, a, a small report. So this is a bare bone report, it was not part of uh, the deliveries, but this is just to showcase the flexibility uh, of our tool. And uh, so we have here, uh, again, as a confirmation, the three uh, different groups. The all groups are, all group FCIs are plotted here, are computed and then plotted here. And we can see, for instance, the high income is the group in red, uh, is the, the time series in red. And we can see the fluctuations 
uh, bear in mind here the, the dates here. So here, for instance, we have the, the crash in 2008 and, and forward. And uh, we also have here, importantly, the group membership. So this is, uh, this is for each of the group, high income, middle income, and low income, we have all the countries represented on the X axis. And on the Y axis, you have the value of the loading. Remember, a high loading means the country belongs really well to the group, and a low, lower loading means that it doesn't belong super well. For instance, for the low income group here, we have uh, the four highest uh, loadings uh, belong to, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, we have uh, uh, UV might be Burkina Faso, we have Mali, uh, we have Niger and, and Guinea-Bissau. Here, those are the four that represent the most the group level FCI. And here, for instance, maybe this, uh, this data point here from Madagascar with a very low loading, it, it means that uh, maybe the financial condition of Madagascar is not well represented by the group level financial condition. So now the question arises, what uh, grouping can we do uh, so that all uh, these loadings are as high up as possible? And this, as explained before, is provided by our second grouping method, which is the ex post method. And it creates the group so that uh, these, uh, these, these loadings are as high as possible. And so the overall statistical fit is better. If we do that, we have a specific grouping, which is not necessarily regional in the ge ge geographical sense, but uh, which is the best grouping possible in a statistical sense. And uh, this leads to uh, some further economic interpretation, which I will let uh, my colleague Patrick talk about. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Guillaume. I will share my screen as well with you. Um, just to be clear up front, unfortunately, I have to um, head out to a hearing in the Bundestag right after my presentation, so I won't be available for, uh, for further questions. Um, but yeah, as Guillaume mentioned, there are very uh, many ways to, um, to compute these, these FCIs. And what we found had the best statistical fit was with a um, fixed loading and an ex post classification. So the idea is to let the data speak for themselves. And interestingly, you saw the table before, you had high loadings, relatively high loadings at um, 0 0.3. Using that method, we often, for, for most of the countries that belong to a particular group, we had loadings well above um, 70, 75%, meaning that this is a lot better uh, or a much better fit than, than the other method. And as well that these HICMIC and LIC classification might not really capture some latent factors that actually determine or determines which kind of um, financial vulnerabilities certain countries and certain groups share. So what we have here is now the result of an FCI based on um, ex post fixed, uh, fixed loadings. Um, and we have five different groups. Um, G1, G2 are the biggest groups. So about 40% of the countries in the sample belong to G1, which we call the classics. Um, I will go into detail in, in, in a second. G2 are the terms of trade sensitive, which uh, make up about 30% of the countries in the sample, which means that seven out of 10 countries within the sample falls into one of those two groups. And then the other three groups um, are some sort of variation of um, the first two groups. So they have, they might share certain fundamental characteristics, but have certain pronunciations. Um, which make them a very specific and interesting case. So when we go into the groups, we look at the classics first. The classics, um, we use the term because um, it's kind of what um, main, or what, what most people, policymakers would associate with um, the kind of uh, standard problems that um, many developing and emerging economies face, which means um, high dependency on global monetary conditions, um, as well as commodity prices. So we see, for example, here, these are the FCIs for these five different groups. The G1 is the uh, red, um, red line here in the graph that you can see. And um, you can see that financial conditions improve as long as uh, commodity prices go up with the financial crisis. Of course, um, the indicator worsens quite a lot. 
improved thereafter. And then there was quite a bit of volatility. I mean, this is what we see at first sight, right? This is also why the policy brief that came out of that research is called Buckle Up, It's a Ride. Um, because really what we see here is that um, financial stability or financial conditions in developing and emerging economies that we had in that sample really do resemble a sort of ride on a roller coaster. And of course, as long as we don't fix that, I mean, we don't really need to think about um, why uh, so many developing and emerging economies face such huge problems in terms of their own development. When there is no stable cap capital market, economic development becomes almost impossible. So we had that, uh, that crash here, um, notably then um, financial conditions uh, improved partially also because of um, a lot of speculation, especially um, in foreign exchange markets um, in 2010, 11, the Brazilian finance minister, for example, was talking about a currency war, but overall in terms of financial stability, um, that did help the, the economies. And then things started to deteriorate a little bit with the um, Fed taper tantrum and the China jitter. So when the uh, growth engine in China started to, to slow down, that affected many um, commodity prices. There were concerns about um, fi financial um, tightening. And this is also what we see here um, with the um, tightening prospects of, of the Fed that financial conditions started to, to deteriorate. And at the end, what we see for all groups um, is that uh, financial conditions improved after the, uh, the Corona shock, which particularly hit um, the, the classics um, very, very hard because obviously everybody was rushing out of um, currencies in developing and emerging economies to the, the, the US dollar, there was a lot of uncertainty. And those countries um, that are most vulnerable to these financial, to these hard capital flows were the most affected. Um, so that was um, the, the, the classics. The other big group is the terms of trade sensitive, as the name indicates. These are countries that are sort of the opposite of G1 because um, they benefit from, for example, an appreciation of uh, the US dollar um, and uh, falling commodity prices because that improves their terms of trade. Uh, many of these economies, um, many of which are also um, in, in Africa, right? The share of licks is very, very high in that group. So many of these economies, they have um, crude and refined petroleum, for example, as their top import. So of course, when the prices for that drop, then um, they, that uh, lowers their, their import bill and improves their, um, their financial conditions. So we see in some ways um, when we look at, well, obviously they were also affected adversely by the financial crisis, although with the time lag compared to um, the, the first group. But then um, what we see here notably, for instance, um, with the commodity price slump, conditions in G1 deteriorate, conditions in uh, G2 um, improve. Um, group three was uh, what we call the sovereign debt strugglers because um, here the notable feature was that um, sovereign debt as percentage, uh, percentage of GDP was the highest among um, all the other countries. And notably what we see here is that over time it is the most stable group, right? So the kind of um, implication, the kind of Minskian idea that public finances are more, more stable than, than private capital um, seems, to be, uh, seems to be confirmed by, by, by the SCI. We see from 2015, 2016 on a deterioration series of, of defaults, which then rapidly um, improves though in terms of financial conditions um, with the G20 debt service suspension um, initiative. Then um, for G4, um, it is the, what we call all terms of trade um, because they resemble in many characteristics, um, the group two, very poor economies, um, very small economies, um, which are dependent on uh, prices of precious metals, notably gold, um, but uh, in terms of uh, poverty levels um, and, and subsistence agriculture, et cetera, um, th there is a big, uh, big overlap with what we see in, in G2. It's really the, the dependence on the price of, of precious metals, which um, makes it distinct to, to G2. And then finally, um, we have the private debt strugglers. They are um, a uh, classic uh, variant of, of 
G1, um, because, well, what we see here is that the volatility is even larger than for um, what we call the, the, the classics. And um, that group has very high levels of uh, private debt, um, very, very low foreign uh, reserves, very, very low stocks of foreign reserves. So as soon as capital rushes out um, and their currency is in free fall, that creates high inflation and um, many defaults. The problems that is leading or the, the, the economic, um, the economic uh, um, or, or the means to fight um, a kind of uh, reverse capital outflow, right, um, are very limited if you just have a very limited stock of, uh, of reserves. So that's notably here um, what, we, what we see, um, high, very high volatility um, due to the nature of, uh, the, um, of the private debt often foreign denominated. Um, our policy recommendations, I will only go briefly into that. What we have on a global level is that we definitely do need to curb speculative capital flows, right? That can happen either through outright capital controls, a Tobin tax, because a lot of um, the trade is obviously being done um, in terms of high frequency and algorithm trading. We also see it, well, in, in all markets, right? Whether it's um, commodities, currencies. So um, using such a tax would throw a wheel in the sand of that speculative machinery. And what we could and should also do, of course, is find ways to restrict derivatives trading because this is really where the big amplifier lies. Um, then the next um, policy measure that we, that we recommend is a central bank corporation to stabilize real exchange rates, notably offset inflation rate differentials by appreciations and depreciations of, um, of exchange rates, right? Um, and this way, that would obviously also take away the incentives for carry trade, which account for a very large share of um, the speculative capital movements. And then developing countries, of course, also need better access to foreign reserves to fight off um, certain capital outflows. Um, and we need definitely uh, now even more so than ever, it seems, um, a new framework for uh, ordinary debt restructuring. Um, that has been pushing for an international developing country debt authority. And this is definitely an idea that should be picked up again. And finally, um, I mean, without these big global changes, right, um, it's going to be very, very tricky for each country mm. and each group to stabilize then, their monetary conditions. Patrick, only one thing. I think this is the last slide. It is uh, the last slide. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Close. yeah. Right. So um, depending on the specific nature of um, or the specific feature of each group, um, we do recommend a certain prioritization that also goes beyond um, beyond kind of monetary fixes, so to say, right? Notably industrial policy space for many of the poorer economies stabilizing the external sector and somewhat getting rid of the trade imbalances that then feed into current account imbalances and um, prove highly destabilizing. All right. so. Going into all the details, um, here are the two links um, that you can find for the technical paper and the policy brief. And that's for me. I thank you very much. Once again, I do apologize. I need to um, head off, rush off to my next appointment. But I thank you very, very much for, um, for your attention, for the invitation. And I am leaving you in very good hands with proceeding Guillaume. I think you're still muted, Daniela. Ah, sorry. No, thank you, Patrick uh, and the Guillaume Hashid for the presentation. Uh, this overall view of the FCI um, that, as I, I mentioned, is a very useful tool for developing countries policymakers. Uh, then now we we'll have. Um, uh, Laurisa uh, Munich uh, from the Freie University of Berlin uh, that will present the shortcomings of the global financial safety net for low income and middle income uh, countries. I only would like to say that the, under this project, then the global financial safety net tracker was expanded. Then we have all UN members uh, and 
is a very useful tool also as Larissa will, will explain to us. The floor is yours. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, only a change to the presentation mode that then the visual visualization is better. Um, my computer stopped working. Ah. Great. It's like... How about this? Ah, okay, great. Okay, let's see whether it works. Um, thank you very much. It's an honor for me to be invited to present um, the Global Financial Safety Net Tracker um, on behalf of Barbara Fritz and um, William Quing and Josh Pitts and Marina Zuka Marquez, um, who all contributed uh, to this project. And I also want to thank you, Cornelia Caldevay, who's going to discuss um, the tracker as it stands today. Um, so thank you very much um, for the invitation on behalf of our team. Um, the, the presentation is actually entitled No One Left Behind, the shortcomings of the Global Financial Safety Net Tracker for developing countries during COVID-19, um, which is kind of pointing to the uh, results that we find um, when we um, look at the global uh, system of insurance and backstop for financial crisis in developing countries and emerging markets. In contrast to the tool that has been presented Previously, um, we are not um, uh, entering into data mining, um, but we uh, kind of um, allow a tool that uh, presents the data as is uh, in order to pursue analytical um, uh, questions, analysis um, that might occur. What is the global financial safety net? Um, it used to be uh, the International Monetary Fund, and it used to be quite small. Um, and um, what started as um, the International Monetary Fund and, um, became a kind of the a firefighter in financial crisis after the end of Bretton Woods with a rather small lending volume um, increased steadily over time. Um, when oil price volatility um, uh, get, was getting higher and debt crisis of uh, the 1970s and 1980s occurred, after the end of Bretton Woods, so-called regional financial arrangements were founded. Liquidity pools of jointly held foreign exchange reserves of neighboring countries um, that were lent to members in case of financial crisis. Um, and they were kind of, um, well, let's say an alternative, which is not to say they can substitute, but as an alternative uh, to the global uh, monetary fund, to the international monetary fund. They have these regional funds, different sizes in terms of volume, and they are governed and organized quite differently. Um, and what we know today as the global financial safety net is again quite different um, from that time um, because it has become much more complex. Um, it has changed enormously um, because new sources of temporary liquidity uh, took hold in response to financial crisis. We have um, a significantly stronger regional level besides the International Monetary Fund, because much more, many more regional funds uh, were created or were those that existed were enlarged in volume. Um, of course, we have uh, a grown International Monetary Fund with a larger uh, size today, um, but uh, most the, the most vivid change can be seen in bilateral instruments. Outside the so-called multilateral system, central banks interact with each other providing so-called currency swaps to each other for temporary liquidity provision in terms um, in times of balance of payment stress. Um, further instruments are there like uh, repo agreements, um, like hedging instruments, um, like bilateral loans, of course, and also multilateral development banks enter this field of short-term finance. Um, we do not look at the, or the global financial safety net tracker does not look into these further instruments, but into the international monetary fund lending, the regional funds lending, and uh, the central bank um, instruments. So let's say the interim conclusion is the international monetary fund is no longer alone. Developing and emerging economies can solve liquidity problems today in a larger variety of ways 
than they could do um, in the 1970s, 80s, or up to before the global financial crisis. What does it mean? Um, first of all, it means that the International Monetary Fund has recognized that it's not alone anymore, of course, and is also doing research on the global financial safety net. This is the view taken from a recent IMF paper that the, that the IMF has on the global financial safety net as a, as, a global, um, as a global net, so to say, and from the global level. What this does, it suggests that the global financial safety net has grown in volume, um, in absolute terms and in relative terms. But what it does not show is what does this growth mean and this complexity that I just showed you for developing countries, emerging markets, advanced economies. So for different income groups, regions, single countries. And this is exactly um, what is missing, so to say, in the global picture and what the global financial safety, uh, safety net tracker does. It um, provides analyzing the inequalities that are key for crisis response capacities of emerging markets and developing countries um, in order to understand better how uh, developing countries and emerging markets are insured and backstopped during financial crisis, such as the COVID-19 shock. Um, so we disaggregate uh, those data uh, that the Global Financial Safety Net Tracker tracks and reports. Um, into income groups. You can see here on the left um, scale, the absolute US dollar values on the right hand side, um, those values as percentage of GDP. Um, we have the same color coding as before. So the regional funds are red, um, the blue are the swaps and the IMF lending is um, pictured in a dark and light green. Dark green is the conditional uh, facilities and light green is the unconditional facilities. And what you see here is the so-called lending capacity or insurance capacity of the global financial safety net by income groups. And um, basically you see um, that we have a strong relation between um, income groups, even over time, uh, and um, the, the level of insurance, so to say, that each group has. And we see a strong tendency that the higher the income, uh, the better those countries are insured or the more volume they have accessible in case of need uh, in the global financial safety net from a more or higher variety of sources. Um, an exception are high income emerging markets um, that we singled out here of the high income group. So these groupings are done by World, income, uh, by World Bank Income Group classification and the emerging market and developing country uh, differentiation is done based on the IMF country group classification. Um, we go further into those uh, disaggregation forms and we look into different regions. Um, and if we split them, not only by income groups, but by regions, we also see that there are inequalities in the global financial safety net um, that have a strong geographical dimension, where you see here East Asia and Europe are much better equipped with lending capacity in the global financial safety net than the rest of the world. Um, now, what the safety net tracker allows is going through uh, the COVID-19 shock and the pandemic up until the end of 2021. Um, and I will present um, in a very um, aggregate manner some of the results that you can take out out of this interactive tool um, that, um, that show the use kind of how did countries use the global financial safety net in order to respond to the COVID-19 shock. Um, this is the website that you find at the gfsntracker.com um, address. And um, what it allows is visualizing by country and by borrowing source, um, what each UN member country has as a borrowing strategy for balance of payments problems, how the peers of those countries um, acted and um, what the potential borrowing volume of a UN member country uh, would be and which sources it could tap. And, of course, from an analytic, analytical perspective, it shows the complexities of the GFSN and it allows analyzing um, the causes and the consequences of those complexities. So for example, uh, you can click on individual countries to see how much and what kind of liquidity they have available and um, what kind of liquidity they are currently using from which source. Below you find a monthly tracking of swap arrangements of IMF loans, uh, regional fund loans, um, uh, between March 2020 and um, 
uh, December 2021, January 2022. Um, now, what we did is, as I said, we um, kind of a summary um, of what we see over time until now um, since the pandemic took, took hold. Um, first, this is in absolute US dollar terms, um, the lending by regional funds, international monetary fund, and the swaps that have been agreed upon or uh, were renewed uh, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic time since, let's say, yeah, March 2020. Um, and what we see, and this is by income group, and what we see is um, that for the current lending volume or swap availability under COVID-19, um, that um, we, we can track that, or we can see that demand for the International Monetary Fund and for the regional funds is a quite small fraction of available resources. So if you look again for the red and the green bars, um, com this is comparatively small um, and when we, um, in comparison to the swaps that have been used um, in response to this balance of payments shock um, in, in, in most of those country groups. But now you see that we have um, a strong dominance of swap use in especially in high income advanced economies and in other middle income countries. Um, the demand for IMF resources, as I said, is low, but what is interesting is that there's about 80% uh, that has been borrowed without standard conditions. The IMF initially introduced a temporary change in its non-conditional lending in the catastrophe facilities, for example, the rapid finance instrument. And this was extraordinarily used um, by countries that did not use uh, standard conditional facilities of the IMF before. Um, as I said, swaps dominate the GFSN by far and mostly for high in income groups. Um, now, second, if we look at those data in percentage of GDP by country in those country groups by income group, um, you can see that um, a high income advanced economy accessed almost 11% of its GDP in the global financial safety net in reaction to COVID-19 and um, exclusively in the form of bilateral central bank currency swaps, um, whereas an average low income economy accessed a little more uh, than 2% in short term lending in the global financial safety net and primarily from the IMF in the form of conditional and partly unconditional lending. I might have to add um, that the interesting thing about those swaps is that they do not come with any condition. And I'll get back to that later. So we have a different quality of lending sources, um, not only in volume, but also in terms of conditions. Emerging economies mainly relied on the International Monetary Fund and the regional funds that do play a role um, in emerging economies, well, um, much more than in other country groups. Okay. So Marisa, only, I don't know, we are running out of time, then if you could uh, wrap up, I don't know how long you still have. Okay, um, and then um, if we weigh this um, by country over income groups, you see that the regional funds share almost evaporates. So these regional funds are not irrelevant, but mostly relevant for, relevant for rather small economies, um, whereas the bigger uh, emerging markets mostly uh, relief, uh, receive swaps, um, where, which is a network, a kind of bilateral network that small developing countries are mostly excluded. Again, also in use, we have a strong um, use of the GFSN in East Asia, also in Europe. We have some, uh, we have a disproportionately high bar here for Latin America, since we have large countries in Latin America um, that received uh, swaps from the US and from China but we have kind of the same imbalance that we saw for the lending capacity too. Um, so what we take away here is that we see that the global financial safety net has um, suffers kind of from in inequalities that mainly um, disadvantage lower income groups. They are less insured. They have a less diversified global financial safety net at hand. Um, and for them, IMF conditional lending is more relevant than for the income groups. And um, we have an increasing diversity in the global financial safety net that might uh, increase the, those countries' costs, so to say, to access crisis finance. Um, we have this increasing share of uh, currency swaps, and we call this kind of um, a liquidity diplomacy taking hold in the global financial safety net um, with a level um, 
where the level of high quality crisis insurance dep depends not only on globally, um, global institutions, but um, also on economic and partly geopolitical interests of major countries that provide those costs. Um, we see that the GFSN might not be fit for purpose for all income groups. And we, we know, we all of us know that we have kind of, might have a calm before the storm um, with the tightening of US and European monetary policy. So we might have to deal with those um, problems that the GFSN tracker shows um, um, earlier, probably earlier than, than later, maybe even during this year. Um, so I, I think I skipped those um, policy challenges, right, Daniela? And leave the floor to Cornelia. Um, uh, I think you could go very briefly, uh, okay. and then, uh, then uh, people could uh, re read the paper and uh, go to the website. If we look into those different institutions, we have regional funds that have large resources not yet used, as initially shown. Um, so there is a need for those for smaller regional funds um, to increase, maybe for example, through increasing membership or found no new foundations of regional funds, especially in Africa, where we do not see many of those tools in order to level out those regional inequalities could be an option. Um, we see a, a strong need to make those funds that are linked to IMF lending to make them more autonomous in order to use those huge um, uh, crisis finance volumes. And there is a possibility to also, in the regional funds, link um, policy missions uh, like, for example, fiscal space use or uh, climate policies um, to the crisis lending. For the IMF, we see that conditionality is very important, maybe even more important than stigma, but we also see that stigma still rules. So the circumvention strategy of many countries um, seems to be um, pictured in those in those observations that we uh, take out of the global financial safety net tracker, and we see a clear need for bolder redistribution of SDR resources. Um, finally, for coordination, currency swaps and those central banks who issue those currency swaps should become part of any roundtable that looks into global financial safety net components, comparative advantages, and how to use them in order to provide crisis finance at a level playing field for high income, middle income and low income economies. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Larissa. Now we will have a pleasure, we'll have a discussion by Cornelia Caldeway, uh, is a Senior Economic Affairs Officer of UNIDESA. Uh, we have a, really a pleasure to have you here. And then uh, you have 10 minutes. We are late, but no problem. <laughs> We're not so late. <laughs> Thank you, Cornelia. No worries, Daniela. Thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Maybe the microphone. Yes. Can you? OK, fantastic. Yes. Um, so I have prefer, I've prepared a very small presentation also. Let me see if I can share that just with some uh, of my main points let me just see there's lots of stuff going on here let me see if i can now put this into okay sorry it's a little okay can you see it all right not yet okay i think now uh, okay is okay. it happening okay let me put okay. it into presentation mode Yes, many, many people <laughs> forget. So I, cannot, I cannot see how my screen shows up for you right now. So does it show up in the full presentation mode or not yet? No, not yet. Are we there? OK, now. I apologize okay, for great. this. OK, thank fantastic. You. And it works. Um, so yes, thank you very much. I thought it was very interesting the entire morning. Um, I also would have some questions on uh, for the colleagues who prepare, uh, presented the uh, FCIs, but I'm going to skip that for now. Maybe we have a little bit of time later for discussing. Um, I very much enjoyed the presentation by Laurissa. Um, I think she's uh, touching on uh, all the all the relevant points and uh, highlighting the shortcomings. And I'm just going to skip right into a quick summary of her main findings, which I fully agree when she mentions um, the problems of the gaps and the unequal coverage of the global financial safety net. And I think the tracker really points out nicely the unequal access and also the unequal conditions that countries with lower income face um, when they access the um, global financial safety net. 
Um, I also found it very interesting that the tool brings together all the information from different sources. This is really fantastic because when you want to look at it and pull together this information, uh, this really puts it at your fingertips on, on a silver tray almost to be able to analyze what is going on, where are gaps and shortcomings. So congratulations, I think it's a beautiful tool and Daniela already said that it will be extended. So uh, I'm very happy to hear that. Um, also, I really like how it pulls apart the capacity for lending and the actual use. And the capacity for lending, especially in the IMF, obviously depends a lot on country quotas because that is how lending instruments are capped. That is something I would like to touch on a little bit later. And then um, also, Larissa was saying, we have the calm before the storm. I put this under new challenges. And here we have the impact of the war, the ongoing tightening of global financial conditions. Um, we actually see a, a risk of systemic debt crisis increasing, uh, which is something I believe that you discussed already in this group yesterday. And then I do think forward looking, we also need to consider whether the global financial safety net is actually fit for purpose for um, new systemic risks, growing systemic risks stemming from climate change, and also consider what is happening with the global monetary system. Are there changes afoot? What will the role of the dollar be going forward? What is the role of crypto assets? So there are many new things coming up that will also affect um, whether the global financial safety net is um, fit for purpose. Um, I'm going to go to my next slide. Um, this, and I'm glad that Larissa discussed these because I do think they're very uh, relevant and important. What are the challenges and recommendations? Um, I fully agree with the recommendations on the regional financing arrangements. That is definitely something that should play a bigger role uh, on the one hand for diversification of the global financial safety net and also just to increase the overall um, resource envelope that countries can access in times of crisis. We've seen that there were access very little so far. There are different um, reasons why that might be the case. Um, some think that, especially in the case of the Chiang Mai um, multilateralization, initi Chiang Mai initiative multilateralization, there are concerns about how it is linked to the IMF. Um, others say, well, just the fact that it exists may mean that it is not needed so much. So it just kind of gives this what what the country's own currency reserves would give, like the security in global markets. So there are different discussions. Um, of what it means to have a large size, but not use it very much in terms of um, regional financing arrangements. Um, I do think uh, it is important to become a bit more independent from the IMF in order to avoid that stigma and the possibility. However, I think it will be very important to continue cooperation with the IMF because there's a lot of uh, learning, capacity building, peer learning, exchange of experience, coordination that's going on. So I do think it will be very important to maintain that. Um, in terms of IMF reform that is needed, uh, I think there's, I think you can all agree that there is a lot that needs to happen. Um, here we need to have uh, increased non-conditional lending facilities, also rethink conditionalities. How harsh do they need to be? Um, do they lead to the required, uh, to the, the intended outcomes? Uh, the IMF themselves have done some very interesting studies showing that not necessarily these conditions lead to the outcomes that are, that are being looked for. Uh, I would like to point out that really in order to um, deliver all of this, what we need from the IMF, we need additional funding. And we also need new instruments that can flexibly respond to new challenges and risks. And those should be uh, ideally also rapidly dispersing and uh, with very minimal conditionality. So this is something we need to go forward in terms of new instruments for the IMF. Uh, I like the idea of having the currency swaps as part of a coordinated uh, global financial safety net. However, this mm, will have to pull in the different central banks um, who have their current currency swaps for certain reasons, which are geopolitical, but also economic. And there may be need for a pre-qualification in order to enter this kind of currency swap so that large central banks would be willing to enter this. But again, these uh, pre-qualifications might rule out access for the countries that need it most. So there is something, this is the same as for these big liquidity lines of the IMF, where again, the access is mainly for the higher income um, developing countries, emerging countries. So this is something to be very carefully discussed. 
Um, there has been a, a call for more channeling of SDRs. Um, yes, and the channeling should continue through the IMF channels that are available, the Poverty Reduction and Growth Fund, but also the new um, Resilience and Sustainability Trust. And uh, I would like to uh, emphasize also more through um, the multilateral development banks. And I found it very interesting that Larissa mentioned the role of multilateral development banks, um, because they are not usually considered part of the global financial uh, system, uh, global financial safety net. However, they have in the past uh, provided more and more emergency lending, especially now also during COVID-19. So it might be useful looking into their role also for the future. Um, but before doing that, I think it will also be very important to look at a governance reform. <laughs> and this is an old topic. This is something that um, the Financing for Development conferences have called for again and again. The latest was the commitment in the Addis Ababa Action Agenda in 2015 for governance reform at the IMF and the World Bank. And at the IMF, it really means a quota reform. And the quotas really determine about the voting rights, the access limits to um, these financing instruments, and also determine the SDR allocation. So if we can work on the quota, we can actually touch a number of uh, very important reform areas at the same time. Um, there are also calls, which I find interesting, should be pursued for um, allocation of SDRs. Currently, there are calls for a new allocation. Uh, more importantly, in addition to the redistribution of the current allocation from 2021, would be to look into the future what are the uh, criteria for allocation? Currently, it is the IMF quota which leads, to, which leads to the poorest countries getting the smallest amounts. This is something, and I know that colleagues from uh, other regional commissions have called for that. Can we find a different distribution mechanism? Should we maybe look at um, reserve coverings, foreign exchange reserves in different countries and the needs for those in order to allocate SDRs? So I do think there is a number of issues to be looked at for the future. How can we design new instruments, uh, update existing instruments in order to be better prepared for the future. And then the role of MDBs, um, also there has been a longstanding call for them to improve their balance sheets, the use of their balance sheets um, in order to be able to leverage more funding. But I think this is a conversation that takes us even further. Um, I'm just gonna leave it there with these two points and it would be lovely if you have a bit time for discussion and maybe I can also get to ask some questions um, on the other paper. But um, thank you very much, Larissa. Again, I think it's a great tool. And I think it's really pointing out the need for reform in the global financial safety net that we've seen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cornelia. Unfortunately, we are running <laughs> out of time. Then we are, oh, uh, we don't have time no. to discussion, but um, I, I will give the floor uh, for Penelope. But before that, I would like to ask you to fill in the survey uh, before you, you leave the, the meeting. Uh, thank you. Uh, please, Penelope. Thank you very much, Daniela, and thank you to that um, excellent panel. Um, everybody who presented, Guillaume, Patrick, Rashid, Larissa, and Cornelia, I'm very sorry that we don't have time to further extend the discussion, um, but perhaps there will be another opportunity soon. Um, I think the what we've seen is this very rich uh, contribution that has been made during the process of the project by various consultants um, and by the team here at, at UNCLED. Um, we unfortunately have now uh, got to the start of the next session. Um, so there's no time for a break, I'm afraid. Um, we will press on um, and I have great delight in um, inviting Esteban Perez, who is the Senior Economic Affairs Officer at ECLAC, who was our counterpart um, throughout this project uh, from his regional commission. Um, Esteban has proven to be a wonderful and helpful and thoughtful partner in this process throughout. And um, I'm delighted in being able to introduce him to take over the panel discussion on capital flow management, macroprudential regulations, and innovative financing instruments. Esteban, over to you. Thank you. Now we can't hear you if you are speaking.
Esteban, there you Can are. Can you hear me now? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay. Glad <laughs> having a little bit of problem with the micro. This is a uh, panel discussion on innovative financing instruments and micro credential regulations. And uh, we have uh, uh, basically three presentations. The first one uh, will be by developing capital controls. Uh, macro prudential regulations proposals for the post COVID 19 e era by Martin Avel Aveles. Then we have a presentation on a multilateral credit rating agency by Susan Schroeder. Uh, and then I'll intervene about five minutes on innovative financing instruments. And uh, then we have a uh, discussion by Jayati Ghosh. Uh, and then a discussion from Horacio uh, Aguirre. Jayati Ghosh from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and Horacio Aguirre from the Central Bank of Argentina. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Martin Aveles, who's the director of the Equa office in Buenos Aires. Uh, Martin, you have 15 minutes. I'll be fairly strict with the time, so I'll interrupt you if you go over it. So the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Esteban. Can you hear me well? Good. Yes. Thanks, Esteban. Thanks, Penelope. And everyone else here, colleagues, et cetera. Um, my purpose in this uh, 10, 15 minutes is to expose the main findings of uh, several policy-oriented studies which uh, we've pursued <clears throat> in the context of this project on capital flow regulation. Uh, uh, the, the time span of these studies is the last 15, 20 years, and we've covered three developing regions, and let me list the countries so that everyone, anyone who's interested in reading these papers later can, can resort to them. In Latin America, we've covered Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. In Africa, we've covered Ethiopia, Ghana, Morocco, Nigeria, and Zambia. And in Asia Pacific, we've covered India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, Philippines, Thailand, Taiwan, and Vietnam. I will first present uh, the projects uh, main working hypothesis, I think that is important uh, in the way of framework, then the main findings very briefly though, and if I have a few minutes left, I'll take a closer look at, at Latin America and its situation currently in the light of, of, of these discussions. So let me begin by posing the main premises or, or working hypothesis of, of, of this part of the project. Um, in a world of uh, currency hierarchies, what uh, we believe is that the main constraint to growth in developing countries is the balance of payment constraint. This is the first building block for the whole project. In this context, and in a context of increased financial integration and greater uh, exchange rate flexibility, uh, the economic performance uh, of developing countries is increasingly de determined and conditioned by the workings of the international financial uh, architecture. We uh, would argue that fiscal policy itself, not only monetary policy, tends to be pro-cyclical uh, in this context as it is affected by sovereign risk, perce sovereign risk perceptions and, and, and that kind of, 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 of influence. So the question guiding the studies, uh, given these features, uh, uh, is, is pretty evident. Can capital flow regulation help increase policy space and uh, improve the conditions for furthering developing, furthering development in, uh, in the global south in developing countries. The question is, to be brief, yes, but it is not so easy. And I'll elaborate a bit more on that. There are various types of uh, capital flow regulation devices, capital controls, um, Etc. Uh, we've analyzed them in, in, in from different perspectives as per their objectives, whether they apply to outflows or inflows, whether they apply to short or to longer term flows, what type of agents they're applied to, whether they uh, are designed in terms of uh, you know quantity restrictions or or, or uh, uh, in terms of price controls, etc. Let me just list the the main findings in general and maybe. Uh, the uh, some elaboration to be made uh, in discussion, and actually, uh, Jaya Digosh, who's been part of this project, uh, might want to more go into more detail as per the, the Asian experiences. But let me now now outline this, these main findings. 
Uh, well, first and, and, and most importantly, capital controls are indeed effective in mitigating financial volatility and instability in developing countries. They can change the composition of capital flows in favor of longer term flows. And most importantly, they can increase not just monetary policy autonomy, I would argue also fiscal policy space. Um, also, uh, the studies found that the exclusion of capital controls and regulations, that is the increase in uh, financial integration and liberalization has not enhanced stability. It has not attracted long-term capital. It has not increased investment rates. That is uh, pretty outstanding to see how through the medium to long term, increased financial integration has not led to increased investment rates, but on the contrary, to reduce investment rates. And in some cases, uh, increased financial integrations, integration has led to increasing uh, dollarization of portfolios in domestic economies. The problem is that first, of course, as you uh, all know, circumvention of controls and regulations is very difficult to prevent, whether those are made via over and under invoicing, whether those are made via uh, uh, disguising financial investments through FDI. There are lots of different ways to do this. But also that financial liberalization, as we know it, is very, very much path, path dependent. And this showed up in many of the studies. That is, even uh, with political will and uh, an, an interest in pursuing uh, some type of uh, re-regulation of financial flows, uh, financial liberalization has proved very difficult to unwind. Legacy capital is very powerful, both uh, in terms of its macro effects and politically. And especially, this is very path dependent in national terms. So one of the discussions that arose during, during the project is whether this can be, whether this should be pushed if uh, we agree on the fact that capital flow regulations are would be, if put in place, would be better for policy space in the global south. Whether this could be discussed, even if not globally, at least regionally, with some more regional uh, cooperation, um, we can. Uh, pursue on, on, on some of these issues later if there's time. Let me uh, briefly end with a few notes on the situation in uh, Latin America, where we come from, uh, even if it's, this is only for informative purposes. But I think, or we believe it is, it is important to, to note that uh, Latin America and the Caribbean region had been caught for the six or seven years prior to the COVID crisis in a low level growth trap, we would call it that way, um, where decelerating uh, exports uh, led to growing current account deficits. These growing current account deficits led to growing foreign indebtedness and into a growing dependence on short-term flows. This growing dependence on short-term flows led to pro-cyclical fiscal policies, which led in turn to low growth low investment and so forth. Uh, some people call this a low level equilibrium trap. We would rather call it, or I would rather call it a low level uh, neoliberal financialization trap where fiscal policies especially tend to be pro-cyclical and not pro-growth uh, uh, in order to be palatable to international financial markets in a context of increasing need of short term financial flows. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean entered and leaves the COVID crisis as the most indebted region in the global south with the highest debt servicing ratios. So it should not come as a surprise uh, that in the near future, uh, things are not looking good given the growing dependence, as I mentioned, of short-term capital flows and the monetary policy tightening that we're experiencing in the global north. So, uh, in the medium to in the short to medium term, we don't know so much about the long term. Uh, Latin America and the Caribbean is likely to face low growth, growing volatility, growing financial fragility, and uh, certainly pro cyclical macro policies, which will reinforce the low growth expectations we currently hold. Um, in this context, uh, business as usual. Uh, will probably not do the work. Certainly discussions on 
uh, regional financial arrangements on SDR reallocations, on the capitalization of uh, development banks, on what is going to be uh, uh, elaborated now by Susan Schrader uh, uh, on, on the international credit rating agencies, on innovative financial needs. So all this is absolutely uh, needed. It is uh, uh, desperately needed, one would say, for the global south. But uh, as a final word, uh, uh, we would like to, to argue that uh, if more policy space is needed, all these things will not suffice. And the Latin American countries and global South countries, to be more general in this case, should be encouraged, not discouraged, to enhance the, political, uh, the policy toolkits with a, a more systematic and, and cooperative approach to capital flow regulation. Uh, this is uh, not uh, something too original, but uh, since we're headed towards uh, pro-cyclicality uh, in its uh, in, in, in across the board in the region, we think that we have to put uh, these ideas forth uh, as uh, boldly as we can. Thank you, Esteban. This is as far as I go for now. Thank you very much. Um, I'll give the floor now to Susan Schroeder who will present uh, on uh, multilateral credit rating agency. Uh, Susan is a lecturer in economics at the University of Sydney in Australia. And this is a uh, part of a uh, work that ECLAC has, uh, has done on innovative financing instruments as part of a proposal for the reform of the global financial arch architecture. So Susan, the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Sydney, Australia. Um, it's almost Friday morning here. Uh, it's about midnight. So um, uh, yeah, so it's quite a global reach uh, this group is having. Um, I'm gonna actually, for stability purposes, I'm gonna uh, shut my video off uh, and pull up a PowerPoint and I'm gonna share um, screen. All right, so share screen. And which one do I want? I want this one here. All right. So this um, PowerPoint is a, uh, a version of what I provided uh, ECLAC in its recent workshop. And, um, and some slides I'm not gonna have time to go through, but I provided them here for completeness. So um, um, I have sort of a set mind, um, a set of slides in mind that I'm gonna go through with you tonight. And uh, the, the paper that I wrote was on a multilateral credit rating agency. I've published uh, work on public credit rating agencies at the national level. So this was an opportunity for me to think about what um, um, a similar agency would look like at the international level. So um, I thank you for the, the possibility to think about this and the, and the growth that um, uh, took place in my thinking. And, um, and so, yeah, so let's get to it. Um, when I was um, uh, discussing um, uh, the ideas about an MCRA, um, I was, uh, it was pointed out to me that it should really address um, um, a couple of key objectives, make sure to hit these. Uh, one was improve and stabilize credit risk assessments of sovereigns, particularly EMDEs, emerging market developing economies. And the second was to facilitate sustainable development goals Okay, and as I was thinking about this, um, uh, about these objectives, I was thinking that they have to be accomplished in the context of climate change. All right, now you probably have heard, um, Australia, we've had um, uh, three uh, once in a century events in the span of five months. Uh, we've had um, 880 millimeters of rain in five days. It's been pretty drastic down here. And so this is sort of shaping my, um, my thinking about policy going forward is that it really has to uh, take into account climate change and of course, um, how that impacts both advanced and EMDEs. All right, so the paper is gonna would discuss um, uh, ways to improve and stabilize credit risk assessments. For instance, uh, one thing that a, an MCRA could do is validate the current methods, okay, of credit rating agencies and the revisions made to those methods Currently, there is no space uh, um, uh, to do that. 
right? They do that on their own, but I think it needs to, really needs to be put out in the public and uh, the MCRA could do that. So that's just one way. Uh, just check the methods and see um, um, what could be done better, okay, with respect to uh, the sovereigns um, of EMDEs. All right, and then uh, for time's sake, I'm gonna jump to another one, which has been really quite popular um, in this project, um, lengthening time horizons, right? There seems to be bias um, against EMDEs because the time horizons that they're being evaluated um, with um, is, is rather unfair, right? Being, um, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, all right, so those are just two of the uh, suggestions for improving and stabilizing credit risk assessments. Because once you improve and stabilize the credit risk assessments of sovereigns, then investors feel much more secure about investing. And, um, uh, and so that will help flow of funds to uh, sovereigns. Um, right, so facilitating sustainable development goals. Um, the achievement of SDGs is contingent on how climate change unfolds, yeah? And so what I did was sort of relate um, uh, the importance given to climate change and as how they relate to industrial configuration and performance of firms, excuse me. Um, but um, hopefully that makes sense. All right, so this, this lengthening timeline horizons, there seems to be uh, with the pandemic, a perception that EMDEs um, were biased against because they experienced such severe downgrades, even though they didn't spend as heavily as the uh, advanced economies did, and advanced economies didn't have uh, much in the way of downgrades or warnings. Yeah, so um, uh, it's thought uh, that uh, the one of the problems is that uh, the time horizon is off for EMDE. So what is this time this timeline problem? All right, so credit rating agencies create information for investors. That's their product, all right? So I'm thinking about Moody's, Stedham Poor's, and Fitch, all right? And their target audience, okay, is professional investors. They're not interested in mom and pop investors. And moreover, uh, they're not interested in all professional investors, but investors with three to five year horizons for their investments. And so they're not that interested in professional investors who are interested in um, um, uh, longer time horizons for their investments, right? And they do exist, right? So it's not surprising that when you look at the methods of the rating agencies, uh, their quote, long-term unquote um, ratings employ timelines of three to five years in length, right? Well, if you're familiar with the cycle literature, the business cycle, uh, wave literature, um, net cycles, um, that cycle three to five years is actually pretty quick. All right, so, um, but anyway, this is what they, they use for long-term ratings. Uh, again, there are investors who are interested in, um, uh, and these investors such as pension funds, hedge funds, insurance companies, will have more stakeholders uh, listed later um, um, in a couple of minutes. Uh, they are interested in things like infrastructure projects, which have timelines of 10, 20, 30 years. And EMDEs are going to be very interested in these projects because they are developing, you know, and uh, they would like to attract the, the funding from these folks. Well, with a three to five year time um, uh, length, um, um, assessing sovereign risk uh, is really quite tricky because uh, EMDEs uh, face um, volatile conditions, both from within as they try to, to grow and externally as they um, uh, receive uh, instability from overseas in terms of rising interest rates or changing foreign exchange rates. And so it's, it's, very, un, it's very unstable. So it would help them to be evaluated on longer term time horizons that would facilitate stability in the event of some sort of event. Um, it's much easier to sort of smooth out the uh, impact when you have longer time horizons, when you have a, a short time horizon of three to five years. All right, so um, yeah, so there seems to be um, some justification for that. Um, right, so investors with longer time horizons, so what do they do? Uh, what they do is they evaluate risk assessments in-house and then they cross-check as best they can. And they are gonna be using the assessments of rating agencies, it's just that it's not ideal. So with, the, with a multilateral credit rating agency, um, this is a contribution that could be made, you know, is to develop, um, uh, risk assessments of longer term time horizons. Yeah. So validate um, the methods of rating agencies. Yep. That's a good thing. And then start to develop uh, methods of um, assessment 
with all the time horizons. Now, DISA early in the year had a, had a suggestion, uh, extend horizons of current methods through band charts and scenario analysis. So current methods of sovereign risk assessment uh, using band charts and scenario analysis. When I heard this, I sort of popped up and was thinking, okay, that's the IMS framework for evaluating public debt dynamics. And um, the equations in that framework, I don't think are suitable for the EMDEs, right? They're, it's very simplistic, or right? it's better suited for economies which have well-developed capital markets and financial systems. And this is not what the EMDEs have, yeah? So um, it's a good idea, um, but the fan chart and analysis have to be specialized for the EMDEs for them to have a fair go, right? Um, so should the equations and assumptions vary to suit the EMDEs? Uh, the associated rating scale must differ from the scale for advanced economies, otherwise EMDEs are, are disadvantaged, right? And so this is something else that the, um, the multilateral credit rating agency could do is look at things like uh, loss functions. How could a loss function, which is gonna be underlying um, uh, this framework, the IMS framework, how could, be they, how could they be adapted to EMDE's context? So there's lots of questions and lots of possibilities for interesting research with this little entity. All right, um, okay, so how do I orient a, a, an MCRA? Okay, so climate change has been for, you know, really in the forefront of my mind lately. And um, I was looking at the methods of the rating agencies and what they're doing with climate change is that they're using their original methods and they're incorporating climate change as sort of add-ons, you know, as sort of uh, modifying or, or adjusting uh, their quantitative analysis for qualitative features. That's how they're incorporating climate change. And I was thinking I have to come up with something distinctive. So why don't we reverse this? Why don't we give environment a prominent role? And we're gonna be thinking about how the environment impacts credit risk, you know? So it's not peripheral anymore. It's actually quite front and center. And I think going forward with climate change, institutions are gonna to have to start thinking like this. So it's, it's a fairly radical, but I think the UN has the chutzpah to actually um, to do this, all right? Um, all right, so in this way, attention is focused on how climate change has been, is, and will be influencing performance of firms or industries and sovereigns, all right? Okay, so... Um, Yep. Susan, I'm sorry, could, could you please uh, finish in about a couple of minutes? Yep, yep, we'll do. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, yeah, the example with Australia, I'm going to just um, yep, sorry. cut that out. All right, so um, achievement sustainable development goals can be just more directly. Um, and the orientation can be easily accommodate approaches to economic development. Jeffrey Sachs mentioned earlier this year um, in, in that DC meeting that the uh, rating agencies are very good to assess credit worthiness of sovereigns, but they're not very good at assessing economic development. So this orientation, I think, could easily accommodate economic development at the heart of credit worthiness. So I'm gonna skip, um, cut to the chase in the back here. Um, all right, so the, the, the slides that I'm, I'm cutting away from, they give you the structure of the um, MCRA, you know, the, the management, the governance, the divisions within it. Um, and this slide is talking about how would this thing be funded? Um, so I think the initial funding could come from grants from UN, contributions of sovereigns and central banks, okay, and stakeholders. And I'll show you stakeholders in just a second. It needs to shift quickly towards a self-sustaining state. Okay, I like to see it as, as independent operating as, I, as it could be within the UN. Because I don't like to, wouldn't want to see it uh, sort of um, um, jerked around, okay, through financing. Uh, conditions placed upon it. it needs to be self-sustaining, I think. And then the MCRA should shift towards it or could shift towards it by reverting to the old subscription model used to rely on rating agencies used to use for revenue. All right, the rating agencies now use an issue or pace approach and, um, and there's conflict of interest problems with that. But this model could work because the MCRA isn't interested in profit. It just wants to generate some revenue to to keep itself sustaining. So the fee for a subscription can be set on a sliding scale according to the stakeholder size and locale. And the key to this is create a body of work that be used for a subscription service. That's the uh, analytics and the special projects divisions. Um, they could do that. Okay. All right, so the precedent, so it actually is precursor to this MCRA. That's the International Nonprofit Credit Rating Agency. This was created by Bertelsmann about 10 years ago. 
as an alternative to private credit rating agencies. Um, they recognize that there is uh, issues with that conflict of interest in the issuer pace model. The assessments are overly um, rosy, overly optimistic, and that's because the uh, rating agencies want to keep their business, and so um, they give uh, their clients what they want, which is nice ratings. Um, its funding was structured, so the ICR, the INCRA, was funding structured as an endowment source from contributions by governments, NGOs, civil society foundations, and financial services industries. Funding could not be maintained. All right, one of the problems was that its, rating agents, its ratings were not distinctive enough from the ratings of credit rating agencies. Well, it makes sense, okay? If the government is contributing to this, INCRA, and to paying the rating agencies, why pay for the same information twice, yeah? So funding couldn't be maintained. People, uh, folks just dropped out. All right, so the funding example here- Could you finish, please? Right. Yep, almost done. Um, oh, sorry, so this is an example here. It's possible um, to generate it just with a snippet of the uh, stakeholders. The stakeholders here, down here, uh, sovereigns, banks, pension funds, hedge funds, all this, get them on a subscription service, you can make a lot of money. Challenges, the financing structure, we just talked about this. Support innovative ways to service government debt. I have some ideas in that paper. Uh, convincing government and other stakeholders to incorporate its evaluations. That should be no problem because of the distinctive of the approach. Okay, it could be complementary to the private rating agencies. A regulatory capture, again, I think I've designed it in a way which minimizes that. Um, the uh, rating agencies can't get control of it because and um, uh, they can't mimic it. Yeah, but you'll have to have a look at the paper. So sorry about that, Esteban, I'm probably over time. Um, that's it. Okay, so thank you very much, Susan. And then uh, I will be presenting in just okay. five minutes of mentioning two other innovative financing instruments that we worked on. Uh, the first one is hurricane clauses and the other one is uh, GNI or income linked bonds. Uh, the, uh, both are, are uh, were, were uh, actually uh, were the subject of two papers uh, that are included in a, a publication that will soon be available on the UNTAC website. Uh, the hurricane clauses uh, are, uh, are designed uh, to provide cash flow relief at the crucial point period after a natural disaster event, just when financing needs are high and new sources of finding may be limited. And there are two examples in the Caribbean of countries that have applied hurricane closes, uh, Grenada in 2015, after uh, Hurricane uh, uh, Ivan and after the debt restructuring that that implied, and also Barbados in 2018. The lessons that we've learned from the studies regarding hurricane clauses is first of all, that the rep successful replication of natural disaster link clauses necessitates adequate conditions for mutually uh, beneficial exchange instead in state contingent debt instruments between the government and its creditors. Uh, there's an issue about who will carry out the independent assessment of a catastrophe whose characteristics are contemplated in the clauses associated with natural disasters. There's the issue of, of, the, of the issue of what type of multilateral uh, institution could back a natural disaster uh, a clause. Uh, in the case of Grenada was the IMF, but we may think about other types of institutions that are willing to uh, commit themselves in the negotiation process for the inclusions of clauses linked to hurricanes. And finally, uh, generally by postponing debt service payments, a moratorium will lead to greater future disbursements due to capitalization of interest payments. And then, uh, so there's a trade-off between a moratorium and paying more later, which implies that countries must have the required repayment capacity to make ends meet because otherwise a moratorium simply postpones that distress and default for the future. What we're trying to do with uh, the idea of hurricane clauses to look at the examples of Grenada and Barbados and try to generalize the principle of hurricane clauses to other countries in, the, in Latin America. And we're actually um, proposing this as part of a technical assistance mission to, to Honduras. 
uh, because they have a fiscal responsibility law that they break every time there's a natural disaster or there's some uh, um, shock like uh, the uh, Ukraine war. And so the idea is why not make something like a hurricane clauses institutional to uh, the, uh, those types of fiscal uh, uh, rules. The other uh, instrument that we've been working on is GDP linked bonds. Uh, GDP linked bonds is a financial instrument that links either principal of interest payments to GDP growth. So when the economy finds itself in an upward phase of the economic cycle, interest payments rise and the contrary happens when you are in a downward phase of the cycle. Uh, what we propose to do well in the uh, in the in the document I mentioned is to replace GDP uh, linked bonds with uh, income linked bonds, GNI, national income linked bonds, because they take into account terms of trade effects, remittances, which uh, are uh, are an important part, like Martina Velez was saying, of the uh, uh, external constraint that these uh, countries face, and also provides some security to the investors that governments will not manipulate GDP uh, uh, data. In the, in the document uh, that I mentioned, there is a calculation of a risk premium associated to GNI clause with the Black Scholes models. That fairly interesting is done for uh, about five or six countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And with this, I would like to proceed to the discussion and I would like to give the floor to Jayati Ghosh, professor at, at the University of Hamhurst, Massachusetts. Jayati, the flo floor is yours. You have uh, 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for letting me participate in this very interesting discussion. I'm really going to take off along the lines that Martin has already uh, mentioned in his opening remarks. And I thought that was a very excellent summary of the problems, not just in Latin America, but really in the other regions as well. Uh, I did a study for uh, a couple of studies for the Asian countries, looking at the implications of capital account liberalization and the attempts to do other kinds of capital account management, most uh, notably macroprudential measures, and look at their success. So uh, we looked at nine countries in uh, Asia to begin with, and then subsequently specifically for, cap for uh, prudential management, we looked at four countries, uh, all very important emerging markets, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, and Thailand. The conclusions are actually quite similar to what uh, Martin has uh, mentioned, even in so-called success stories of Asian development. These are seen as significant exporters as supposedly rising economies and generally uh, as more successful in the face of globalization. What, we, uh, what was found in these studies is that capital mobility resulting from the open capital accounts did not lead to an increase in investment rates. In fact, in all of these countries, in significant uh, uh, part of the period, investment rates actually fell. And in India, they've been falling now for nearly a decade. There was, a, furthermore, a significant divergence between savings and investments. And I think that's very important. The domestic savings did not fall as much as investment, and really the gap grew. Uh, in the case of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand, it can be dated from their Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s. But it is something that uh, has shown a varying pattern. But other than India, significant divergence with a lot of export of savings. Of course, the volatility and fragility that come with very rapid movement of cross-border flows is very evident in these countries as well, even though they are seen to be less of a credit risk in general. But because of that, there is a significant reliance on self-insurance in the form of more and more foreign exchange reserves. So if you think about it, the basic macroprudential measure that has been adopted by all of these countries is increasing forex reserves. And that, of course, is expensive, as we know, because the rate of return on uh, the places where the reserves are held, typically US Treasury bills and similar very safe uh, area places, the rates of return are very low. Overall, we find that gross capital flows have been extremely large in all of these countries, but so have gross capital outflows. And as a result, net inflows are really quite small. And in some countries, it's a net outflow. In the case of Malaysia and Thailand, it was net outflows. But even in Indonesia and India, which had net inflows, 
the inflows uh, have gradually declined. The net inflows have declined, even though gross inflows remain very large because of very significant outflows. And that, of course, generates the volatility that has already been talked about. What it also means is that there are very significant seniorage costs of holding these reserves and of the open capital account in general, because the returns on assets abroad are significantly lower than the returns on assets held by foreigners in their own countries. And these seniorage costs have been as high as 5.2% of GDP on average for the later period for the last uh, decade that was considered in Thailand and 2.4% uh, of GDP in India, 3.5% in Indonesia. In other words, really very significant. In the case of Thailand, the seniorage costs alone amounted to more than the net capital inflow through the entire period. Uh, then I looked at macro prudential measures and whether they are a good substitute. That is, other than holding a foreign exchange reserve as self-insurance, what about all the other measures in terms of, you know, uh, regulations on derivatives, regulations uh, trying to adjust the market to a uh, market behavior to prevent uh, bubble buildup and to prevent the kinds of volatility that are observed. I looked at two episodes in particular. I looked at the global financial crisis and its aftermath and the taper tantrum of 2013 and early 2014 to look at the attempts at different macroprudential measures and the degree of success. To very quickly summarize, what we found is that there was some success in exchange rate management, but it was more successful when it was directed towards preventing appreciation than it was for preventing depreciation. There was also some success in reducing particular bubbles in particular asset markets, but these were rather temporary. Uh, so that, for example, you know, restrictions on derivative training, uh, trading in forex markets for particular assets it did play a role, but it was a temporary role. It didn't really work uh, for over a prolonged period. And there was no success in dealing with the problems that I have outlined earlier in the broader problem of the open capital account. Now, all of these have actually got aggravated in the post-COVID situation. And the pro-cyclicality of fiscal behavior that Martin mentioned in Latin America is very evident also in developing Asia. So even Asian government's response to the COVID crisis has been extremely pro-cyclical, has been significantly less than it was after the global financial crisis, even though the problems are greater. And in fact, in some countries like India, it's been negligible, the fiscal response. Despite that, because the economy has declined very sharply and contracted, the deficit to GDP ratios inevitably grew, and this immediately read, led to credit rating downgrades or threats of downgrade. And uh, of course, we've just heard about the possibilities of an alternative approach coming through a public credit rating agency. That is absolutely essential uh, for the future. But I would argue that we need to also do something to deal with the existing problem and particularly the problem of a legacy debt. Because it's not just the procyclicality that we have to worry about. We have to worry about the large overhang of private debt across developing Asia, which has grown very dramatically over the past decade and a half, and for which now there is an enormous legacy implication in terms of continuous payments that are becoming more and more difficult. Sri Lanka, Pakistan, these are all identified as crisis countries today, but there are many more on the verge of crisis. Even India, which is seen as reasonably stable and so on, our trade deficit and our current account deficits have increased rapidly in the last six months, we have a very significant amount of external debt payments due in the next year. And our foreign exchange uh, inflows have declined dramatically. In fact, there's a net outflow, so much so that our external reserves have also fallen by about 65 billion just in the past two months. It's still very large, it's still 650 billion, but it is falling very sharply and the external debts due are already becoming a source of concern. The problem with handling the debt crises in developing Asia today is that it is so fragmented, so fractured, so much of it is privately uh, taken and privately held through bond markets, through a whole range of other uh, areas. So it's much more difficult to restructure and to actually get any kind of debt relief. And so increasingly we have to think of new ways of getting into debt restructuring 
which were not those done earlier. The old hippie type restructuring is simply not relevant, or rather it is less relevant. Of course, it would still be useful, but it is much less relevant. And we have now many low and middle income countries on the verge of significant debt problems, if not absolute crises, uh, which are increasingly hard to uh, handle. And this is all, if you like, the legacy of that open capital account of the past two decades. All this suggests that we really have to rethink capital account management. What I've suggested is that the macro prudential measures that became beloved in the last decade don't really work in terms of the major problem. And therefore, we have to think of administrative controls. We have to think of regulatory practices. And we have to think of new ways of um, underwriting some debt and actually simply reducing or removing some debt in, in different ways. And we have to think of very clear restrictions on new debt, on new kinds of portfolio flows, which uh, are not necessarily going back to the patterns of the past, but are inevitable now, given the very volatile global situation, given the increasing balance of payments problems across certainly this region, and I would say the entire developing world, and the fact that very little can be expected of international institutions in terms of the response. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jayati. Uh, then we have uh, Horacio Aguirre, who works at the research department, I understand, from the Central Bank of Argentina. Horacio, you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Esteban. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers. And uh, thanks to, to Penelope Hawkins for the, for the invitation. And, and congratulations on, on this very, very relevant project uh, that, uh, that um, gathers us together in, in, in this meeting. Um, I have a few slides to, to share, so uh, just a second. Uh, can you see them now? We can see them. Thank you. Uh, and as usual, just uh, let me point out, these are my, my uh, own views and not those of the other Central Bank of Argentina. Uh, so uh, I will... Basically, complement Martin's take on, on the issue and also some of uh, Jayati's uh, points uh, in looking at macroprudential measures and capital flow management measures and foreign exchange intervention in a holistic way. So let's say we have different aims uh, like uh, taming excessive credit growth or mean scan cycles or preventing excessive leverage or uh, preventing systemic liquidity risk in the financial system or coping with the adverse effects of capital flows and currency fluctuations. And there are different instruments that we can employ. So to put it bluntly, uh, the, uh, the core of macroprudential regulation over the years has been, let's say, on the, uh, on the Northeast quadrant, in, based on credit-related instruments and capital-related instruments uh, that uh, in certain countries, they, they can deal with, with uh, the problems of, uh, of excessive credit growth and excessive leverage. Following Basel III, there's always been more, there's also been more emphasis on liquidity related instruments. But uh, the situations that we face in uh, developing economies have a lot to do with what happens in the, in the Southwest quadrant, uh, and where systemic liquidity is an issue, and where the adverse effects of capital flow volatility are, are a very, very heavy issue. And this is where foreign exchange policy and capital controls uh, do indeed. Uh, come into play as, as very relevant instruments to deal with uh, financial stability. So what's the rationale behind this? Well, let me just touch on a, uh, a few points. And these are uh, well-known balance sheet effects of the classic and of the, the hidden type. And I will refer to this in a minute. There's also the stabilizing foreign exchange volatility, contrary to what is conventionally thought, especially in economies where the financial system is underdeveloped. Uh, and in such situations, uh, the, um, the issue is rather, is currency substitution is, is, is really uh, the, the, the financial stability issue rather than intertemporal substitution, which the conventional macro pro instruments uh, typically uh, aim at. So, so let me uh, touch on this in turn. Uh, now there's uh, balance sheets effects, and uh, let's look at a, a very heavily sliced uh, uh, bank balance sheet in, in, in an emerging market where you have assets and liabilities in domestic currency 
and in foreign currency. We know from the experience of Southeast Asia in, in the 90s that there is a problem with, let's say, the conventional currency mismatch, where there are assets, for instance, in, in local currency, but liabilities in foreign currency. And, and we saw this in, like I said, in, in the Southeast Asian countries, a crisis in the late 90s. But even if this problem is solved, uh, even if this problem is solved, if, even if there is a, a reasonable match between assets and liabilities in foreign currency, uh, and we saw this in Argentina actually in the in the 1990s, you can have what we call a hidden currency mismatch problems in that uh, borrowers from banks have income in domestic currency, but they have to pay them in foreign currency, um, say when they, they get indebted in mortgages or, or, or other types of um, of longer term credit. So, so this uh, this mismatch is outside the uh, the bank's balance sheets, but it's inside the economy's balance sheets, and uh, and can it can be very uh, I mean very highly destabilizing, and it can lead to crisis. And we saw this in in, in the 2001 2002 crisis in in Argentina. The response to this is well, first of course to the dollar is, but this is easier said than done. And the other response is macroprudential regulations. This comes in different flavors. In the case of Argentina, a cornerstone of macroprudential regulation in the last 20 years has been basically uh, to have uh, banks lending in foreign currency only to borrowers that can generate revenues in foreign currency. Otherwise, there's no uh, there's no possibility to, uh, to to for banks to lend uh, in uh, in foreign currency. And, and this has been uh, this has been maintained over over two decades, and and, and this has really proved very useful in, in, in cushioning the impact of uh, of uh, uh, exchange rate uh, volatility from the health of the, of the financial system. There are other uh, ways to do this, to basically to have banks internalizing and pricing uh, FX risk. Uh, but but, but in, in, in our case, uh, and there, these other ways are also used, but in our case, this has been the, uh, the main tool. Now, why? Well, this is, uh, and then let me move to uh, the way in which uh, foreign exchange volatility can be destabilizing, contrary to standard reasoning. Right? Standard reasoning in many inflation targeting countries is okay. Let's let's adopt a, a floating exchange rate regime. So as long as the currency floats, this is seen as a risky bet, and uh, uh, this uh, this uh, tends uh, or this goes against dollarization of uh, of private portfolio. Well, in, in in many economies, this is the opposite, and the, the, the right-hand panel, uh, sorry, the left-hand panel shows this for Argentina uh, over, uh, over a few years, in which uh, savings in local currencies, which are the, uh, the gray bars, are negatively correlated with exchange rate. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, I show this for, for just three years, but this can be shown over a much longer time horizon. And there is a more general point here is that the private sector, when it looks at foreign exchange volatility, it expects it to be skewed. It expects it to be skewed toward depreciation. So higher volatility is associated to foreign exchange depreciation. If this is the case, higher volatility will actually incentivize, higher foreign exchange volatility will actually incentivize currency, uh, currency substitution toward the US dollar, toward the foreign currency. Um, so, uh, and uh, this is worse in underdeveloped markets. And this is on the, on the right-hand uh, side panel where you see the interbank forex market during the critical years 18 and 19 in Argentina, in which uh, forex, demand for forex, in, especially in stress, at stressful times, can be three, four, five times the supply for forex. So even very small changes in, in, in demand or very small changes in supply can be heavily, heavily destabilizing. Um, so this points towards a more general point, and, and this is that when um, conventional policy tools, macro policy tools, which are here shown in, in the, the blue area, uh, they work for systems where maturity transformation is lower, where the financial system does a lot of maturity transformation, and systems which are basically based on local currency. Uh, but uh, just as Jayati was, was pointing out a few minutes ago, this may not work for the situations that are faced by many developing economies where the, the financial system is works not so much for credit but for transactions. So it's a maturity transformation is not that high or is actually 
low, and where there's a lot of substitution between local and foreign currency. This is the situations in which liquidity and currency-based macroprudential measures work, work and not the conventional macroprudential measures work. Now, in answer to this, you can say, okay, just develop markets in local currency and you will do away with the problem of uh, currency substitution. Well, this is not necessarily, or, or this is not, uh, uh, may not be the solution. It's certainly not a silver bullet. You can have, and, and as colleagues from the BIS have shown, you can have local currency market development together with higher foreign investor participation. But foreign investors evaluate gains and losses in US dollars, uh, and this increases the risk, uh, the risk imposure. So the risk is shifted from borrowers to lenders. So maybe you issue in local currency, you issue zero in foreign currency, but still it's now the borrowers that bear this FX risk. And they may not want to bear this FX risk when there is some when there is forex volatility this can trigger sales they can push up bond spreads and they can even pressure on, on on reserves and basically on financial conditions at large of the country so one of the so here the issue is not so much uh, the in which currency you are issuing but if you are exposed to these sign stops if you are basically open to uh, or exposed to capital flow volatility Part of the answer is to develop a strong domestic investor base. Another part of the answer is uh, to take measures like capital flow management measures that actually uh, can, can, can cushion you from, from these foreign shocks. Um, what has been the answer in Latin America? Part of the answer has been for its currency-based macroprudential regulation, uh, in addition to conventional macroprudential regulation, which is also in place in many countries in Latin America. Uh, here we see different measures. In, in the case of Latin America, we, we have around 20 countries that have put some sort of limit on foreign exchange positions uh, over the years. Um, there's, of course, heavy foreign exchange intervention, and, and this changes with countries, but, but what, what style as far as I can say, there is a, a, a lot of resort to the tool. And, there are uh, capital flows, uh, ma capital flow management measures. And, and we see this is an index of, of uh, capital flow restrictions for Latin America. Um, and we can see that uh, this has, uh, different countries have uh, taken these measures over the years in, in Latin America. Um, and if perhaps generally today these measures are less stringent, they are still there for most, uh, for several Latin American economies. Uh, now, let me let me mention the case of Argentina, uh, which uh, is the blue line here, and it has gone really from uh, in uh, on two occasions. It has gone from zero uh, or, or from heavy uh, capital account regulation to zero regulation, then to regulation again, then to deregulation again, and uh, uh, actually. Argentina implemented two monetary experiments uh, that implied a full and fast regulation of the capital account. One was in the 1990s, and uh, it ended with a current account crisis and a sudden stop where uh, external debt to GDP almost uh, doubled uh, in, in, in less than 10 years. The second experiment is started in 2016 with capital, full capital account on, uh, openness and the flexible exchange rate regime. It lasted three years and also ended with a current account crisis. And in this period, public debt almost doubled as well. Uh, so what are the, the, the takeaways from, from this uh, uh, very deleterious experiments? Uh, now, one is to avoid fast and strong regulation of capital flows. As Martin mentioned, this, the issue of path dependent of sequency, sequencing is absolutely key. Also of sectoral orientation. Horacio, can you please yeah. wrap it up in uh, about yeah. a minute, please? Okay. Thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'll do that. Thank you. Uh, with, with this slide. Uh, the second is to beware of corner regimes like either pegs or uh, full flexible or, 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 or pure floats have a perhaps a nice start and they seem a, 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 a perfect match for a liberalizing shocks. But as imbalances mount, they show very heavy problems. Um, the third is to beware of hidden currency mismatches for, for the reason I mentioned, and which in the case of Argentina has, has really proved uh, very useful to. to, to um, to, to avoid the uh, impacts of, of uh, currency uh, of forex volatility on the financial system. The fourth is that, for the reasons I mentioned, the development of local currency bond markets is not necessarily a, a silver bullet for financial stability as long as you are exposed to capital flows volatility. And here, the role of non-bank financial intermediations is uh, is much much uh, more important 
in, in many of our of our economies and certainly much much more important uh, than before and also the case of Argentina 2016 2018 illustrates this very well but but also the more general uh, emerging market case uh, during the 2020 market turmoil uh, at the onset of the of the covid crisis where there was a very heavy a very important role for non-bank financial intermediation so this merits further study and further regulation uh, and, and a final takeaway in the case of the COVID crisis, uh, and this is from Argentina as well, that, that CFMs, uh, capital flow management measures, gave, gave temporary policy space uh, for um, to implement counter-cyclical policy. Uh, so this, uh, and with this I conclude, I think we should, uh, and this is a phrase I borrow from, from a, a colleague at the research department, Guillermo Escudé, who wrote a paper on the possible trinity of managed floating uh, capital controls uh, and interest rate uh, policy, uh, which uh, under a, a number of different scenarios can yield a much better result in terms of key macroeconomic and financial volatility than, uh, than other types of policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Horacio. Uh, we have about uh, seven minutes for uh, discussion. So uh, if anyone would like to uh, in any way, would like to raise your hand or have a question, comment, you're welcome to. Uh, if no one has a comment, I'll make a, a couple of comments to uh, use my prerogative as chair of the uh, panel. Uh, the first comment I'd like to make is regarding the external constraints, like uh, Martin and Jayati pointed out. I would like to complement that by saying that there are different sort of external constraints, it seems to me, in Latin America for the larger and smaller economies. And because in the smaller economies, you have a generally a deficit in current account that is, is larger than the deficit in the uh, uh, government account, even in the non-financial public sector, consolidated public sector. And therefore, you have a deficit also in the private sector. And when you have a decrease in financial flows, the re reduction in absorption in smaller economies, it's much larger than, uh, than, uh, than, than larger economies, which generally tend to have some, some sort of a surplus or not, not such, such a big deficit. The other thing, I agree with the, uh, the issues uh, that uh, both Jayati and Horacio pointed out regarding macro financial policies, the need to take into account the, the uh, firms and the private sector, which is highly indebted. And as is um, as some evidence shows, uh, operates with a, with a currency mismatch. And also just to complement what Horacio was saying with, with the debt, I, I completely agree that local markets will not solve the debt problem because the problem is who owns the debt. And so you may have capital outflows uh, from, for example, from an expectation, I just say exchange rate volatility that's associated with exchange rate depreciation, but then that uh, is highly correlated also with sovereign risk, and sovereign risk tend to, tends to determine also corporate risk. So it, 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 uh, it's a wide uh, phenomenon. Finally, I'd like to uh, uh, point out something that Jayate was saying about, about that distress. That's certainly, certainly true for many countries. But I think in some, some economies, what we have seen is that you have to distinguish sometimes your debt situation in terms of, uh, let's say, debt to GDP or debt to export ratio and your, your debt service. And uh, they may not follow the same path and you may stabilize debt, but your debt service keeps growing from past uh, uh, debt commitments. And so you have to have sort of two types of, of policies. With that, I end. I don't know if anyone else would have any comments or if Horacio, Martin, Jayati, you want to make the final comments or Penelope, if you have any comments or Daniela. Yes, thank you. I, I, I found the session um, very engaging um, and very valuable. Thank you very much. Um, I think for me, I would like uh, perhaps to give the floor back to, to all of you um, to reflect a little bit more about what Martin introduced in the in his discussion about this issue of past dependency and liberalization and this concern of how does one actually roll back liberalization once it's been done. Um, Horatio showed us data uh, from Argent, Argent, uh, Argentina where it's quite clear that in fact rollbacks are very very dramatic 
uh, and as our role forwards. And I would like us to perhaps just explore that a little bit more. Um, what advice do you give to policymakers to think about how um, this past dependency can be addressed? Because of course we, we cannot have it as a self-fulfilling prophecy. So how do we how do we address that? And then I have a comment for Susan. Um, Susan, I found your um, intervention really interesting. I mean, I wonder if you could perhaps just address how you see this rolling out uh, for a for a perhaps a, a set of firms for which we now have a different rating based on um, should we say environmental. Uh, friendliness, construction, perhaps you could give us a little bit more on that. Yeah, I'm not quite sure that I understand the, the question. I wonder if you could repeat that. If you sure. Um, what I'm trying to say is, in your new world, where you've got this multilateral credit agency, and you, in the, the ratings are now, as you've expressed it, highly dependent on environment. Um, what, on what basis are you rating firms? Are you rating them in terms of um, their contribution to the um, to, uh, prevention of destruction of the environment? On what basis uh, are you seeing this rating to take place? But perhaps we can give the floor first to to Martin and Horatia and the okay. others, just to talk about the, the issue of past dependency. Uh, hi, just one short comment, Esteban, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Um, um, no, I think it is to a large extent uh, a collective collective action problem. Um, in, 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 let me speak from, from from Latin America and the Caribbean, but I, I, I guess Jayat suggested that's that's also the case for Africa and Asia. Um, that in a context of, of high dependency of, of short-term flows, and we've seen this during COVID crisis and in other crises uh, the last couple of decades, uh, the name of the game in, in international financial markets and in policy circles is differentiation, not cooperation. Uh, if you get engaged in an agenda which, uh, for some reason, implies some kind of uh, challenging of current status quo in terms of the international political economy, then you get frowned upon and your risk premium go up. So in the short term, incentives are really, that's, that's why th this uh, path dependency issue is so, so difficult to, to, to handle at an individual national level. It requires, at the minimum, some kind of regional, if not multilateral, uh, cooperation. Um, I think this was mentioned in passing. It is actually um, elaborated in some of the uh, reports that uh, inflation targeting regimes, which are so prevalent as of the last couple of decades, also uh, require, so to speak, in order to work properly. Uh, uh, full-fledged capital account liberalization or, or, or pretty liberalized capital accounts and flexible exchange rate regimes. And those, are in turn, are another feature which locks in the current international financial situation for the global south. So I cannot think of a solution for policymakers, but for political leaders to in, uh, try to seek for more collaborative regional um, uh, platforms where uh, these things can be pushed for and 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 and, and bring uh, higher up in the in the agenda. Uh, otherwise, it would be a wishful commentary. Uh, I would leave it there. Uh, can Thank I you. add very briefly a quick uh, yes? I, I I agree with that that there is this deep path dependency and and it's also the fact that domestic political classes are also very deeply into the system. So there is a, also a domestic political economy which is pushing you towards this path dependency. But on the other hand, isn't the global situation now so complex, so fragmenting, not just fragmented, but fragmenting more and more and so much less reliable than in the past that there is really going to be no alternative but the regional kinds of things that you're talking about? 
regional or cr cross, shall we say, less centralized, simply because the global architecture is collapsing. I mean, it's a bit like the, the, the British government at the moment. It, it's really not in a, in a viable way. And therefore, we're going to get, I think, more and more, inevitably, more and more regional arrangements, not just in trade, but also in finance. And I hope that's the case, because that does, in a sense, change the bus dependency. Yes, I, I, if I may, I, I would, and in close connection with what Jayati was, was just mentioning, uh, it's, it's not only the, uh, I would say, the, the objective financial conditions which are there uh, to, uh, th that which are there for countries to uh, roll back uh, to, to, to different extents, uh, financial liberalization, or in the case of those countries that have not liberalized, to be very gradual or uh, very careful in, in any liberalization effort. Uh, but there is also, I think, uh, at the analytical level, an, a number of, uh, of uh, changes there that can also help. And, and I'm thinking about uh, the institutional, uh, the review to the institutional view of the, of the IMF, the integrated policy, policy framework put forward by the IMF, the increasing role of the dominant, current, uh, the dominant currency paradigm in international finance studies. Uh, there's also work by the BIS. So, uh, and of course you may, uh, there are a lot of objectionable points in, in, in these lines of work, but at the same time, they all find increasingly a higher, um, a higher role for the kind of policies that we have just discussed in this panel. Uh, of course, in, in the case of, uh, of uh, MF and our international organizations, uh, it tends to be exceptional, but even uh, as of now in the, in the institutional view review, we find that there is, a, the, um, uh, there is now a case for the preemptive use of capital flow measures uh, in um, dealing with uh, foreign, foreign inflows. And this used to be exceptional in this institutional view. And now there is a, something that is not so exceptional, so countries can use this uh, preemptively. So, so, it's, so I think it's a, a matter both of uh, objective conditions, like, like Zayati pointed out, but also of uh, an, an analytical framework that is changing to a certain extent and is uh, perhaps not as much as we would desire, but it's increasingly incorporating uh, these points, uh, which are crucial and, and which, as Martin pointed out, and this, it, it all boils down to a collective action issue. It really boils down to a collective action issue. And, and so uh, uh, the, the regional financial arrangements are key. And, and in the case of Latin America, I think they are very, uh, they, they are, their performance has been relatively poor. Uh, so, so I think that there is a lot to, 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 to gain there, but also multilateral action at, at the highest level uh, is, is key. Um, and here, of course, the, the SDR allocation and the SDR rechanneling is, is very important uh, to complement what countries can do at, at the national level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan, you have? Yep. Um, I'm going to try to uh, what I'd like to see initially is a um, is a push uh, for a wealth tax on gross assets. Um, I've written on that recently, and uh, and that would um, generate the revenue needed to um, 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 honor uh, at least the net interest outlays on debt. Yeah, and I think um, uh, it would be very easy if uh, the net interest outlays uh, were to increase, the wealth tax would increase. It's only a fraction of a percent. Um, and that would take some political will to, to implement. But that would, I think, solve a lot of issues with uh, sustainability of uh, sovereign debt. Um, uh, but how do you, how would I evaluate um, sovereign uh, creditworthiness with the environment at the heart? Um, I lay out in the paper, um, first you wanna have a sort of a sense of the vegetation in your, in your region, all right? And how your country's embedded in your region. And then look at the industrial um, um, embeddedness within that region. And with that information, um, you can get a sense of uh, where the vulnerabilities are, okay? As you know, your vegetation or your climate changes over time. And that's gonna get a sense of where the, again, the vulnerabilities are for your, for the sovereign in terms of addressing the, uh, the uh, issue with that um, industrial configuration and production of uh, activities. And uh, so, yeah, so there's gonna be some cost to it. 
And there's also going to be um, revenue uh, hit to it in terms of a shortening of tax revenue. So it's that would raise um, um, uh, 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 sovereign risk. Yeah. So you have to um, uh, look at um, how climate change is impacting the vulnerabilities in the system of social provisioning. And if it's left unaddressed, sovereign risk increases. If the sovereign can um, address um, and facilitate an ecological transition, then um, sovereign risk will start to decline. And I think the SDGs, the more that a country can um, address uh, the uh, transition, then it could um, uh, de you know, decrease sovereign risk. So it's, um, it's a really good question, um, how to actually translate that into a scheme. Now, I do have in the paper um, uh, a possibility um, of, a, of, a, of a rating scheme based upon that wealth tax. All you have to look at is the uh, degree of um, revenue relative to the, uh, the net interest outlay. And it's possible, I did a, a couple of uh, pieces, applications for Australia and one for the states. It's possible, even with a small wealth tax, not only to... Um, generate the, the revenue needed for net interest outlay, but you could also start retiring sovereign debt. So that would uh, start to uh, begin the, the, to address the historical um, debt overhang. And, um, and so it's possible. Um, it's just the political will of trying to convince legislators to, to implement a tax on um, gross assets rather than net assets. So um, okay. yeah, it's a good okay. question. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. So we're going to, with this, we, I think, uh, close this uh, panel. So I'd like to thank Jayati, Susan, Horacio Martin for these uh, great, great okay. interventions. And I'd like to finish by thanking Penelope and Daniela and Norg and Marina for all the fruitful collaboration, feedback, and discussions that we have had almost for two years. Now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and just in closing, I, you know, this brings us to the end of a two-day session which has been designed to highlight um, the work associated with this global project. Um, I think we can claim it global because of the scope, certainly in terms of financing for development, it has been very extensive, and certainly because of the expanse of the project in terms of um, touching on 193 countries. Um, it's also global because of the range of the actors involved, the three regional commissions, Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, Asia and Pacific. And of course, this has been together with us at UNCTAD. And then as um, I think has become apparent even from this last panel, it certainly has global reach in terms of expertise and inputs. Uh, witness, we have Martin in Buenos Aires and Susan in Sydney um, in this very panel. So in closing, I'd like to thank everybody for their extraordinary contribution with, to what I think has been a very successful project. Uh, there are still some parts of the project that are being finalized as we speak. And certainly towards the end of the month, um, all of these things will be done. I would recommend you and co um, uh, really suggest that you do go to the website, uh, which we'll put up in the chat now. Um, have a look at the website now. Um, we will also encourage you to do that later because we have a e-pamphlet that is being finalized now, which really focuses on the outputs of each of the work streams and the success stories. We will send that to everybody who's participated over the last two days um, and we'll encourage them again to engage with the work, some of which we know will continue in various ways. And um, it would be uh, really wonderful if we could continue with our collaboration so that we continue to see that website as a resource and something that we can continue to develop so that this Collaboration doesn't end here, but it, that it continues into the future. So with that, um, may I ask those who are still in the room, if you could just for a second, put on your videos so we can just look at each other and acknowledge um, the work and the contribution. Um, from my part, it has been a real pleasure to be involved in this project and, and you people have made it so. So thank you very much. Um, Thank you to you all um, and goodbye.